And I just don't think that we should sleep on Brock Purdy no more. Yes, he was a seventh round pick. Yes, he came in late in the season and won six straight games, took him to the NFC Championship before his injury. But Purdy, you would not be slept on no more, bro. All right, we got some kind words from, I don't know, are the Cowboys now a rival team? All right, Michael Parsons uh, has some good things to say about Brock Purdy. We're going to get into that. Kyle Shanahan, and I know the genius tag is thrown around with him a lot. We're going to discuss that and some of the things I'm seeing on film with the All-22. We're going to go over some defensive clips, uh, things that I saw. Well, actually, defensive clips from the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, all that and more. Appreciate everybody for tuning in uh, this morning. Make sure y'all subscribe to this video. All right, all right, all right. We're live on YouTube. We're live on Twitter. If you are on Twitter, you know, come on and hang out with us over here on YouTube. Appreciate everybody that's in the chat right now. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. And uh, hit the flames, man. Let me know how everybody's feeling this morning. We got Mr. For Mr. Faithful 49er. All right, Five Flames, he's feeling good. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, we got Sandra Gomez in the chat. She's feeling good. Got the flames going up. Let's go. Raphael, he was first on the scene here with the flames going up. That's what's up. That's what's up. Mike Shields, let's go. Let's go, Medic Mike. All right, all right, all right. Uh, but, yeah, man, we got a lot of 49 stuff to talk about this morning over the next hour. Uh, I'll also today get to the chat because we didn't yesterday. So when I say get to the chat, I mean bring y'all on live so y'all can kind of discuss some of the things that y'all want to talk about as it pertains to the San Francisco 49ers. We got Amy in the chat, and she said uh, it was funny this morning. Hold on. Let me see. Let me find it. Where is that? Right here. Let me guess. Uh, Croc moved to the west side of 8 Mile Road or still true to the Morada Hood. You know, the funny thing is, first of all, I did just move from Arkansas back to California, back to Stockton. We're renting right now. So I always get people like, why is this guy recording in the kitchen? Bitch, I ain't got an office right now. I just moved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And we downsize a lot from what we had there to here. And uh, give me a little time. Give me a little time. And eventually I'll be back in the office. It just might be like, I don't know, when this lease is up, which is. Sometime next year. So y'all got to deal with this kitchen and the detergent or, or dishwashing liquid behind me and whatever else happens to be in this kitchen for a little bit. All right. But I am not in Morada. I am off of I-5 and Hammer. But eventually I might go back to kind of the Morada. And I'm not from Morada. Matter of fact, when I was a kid, I'm talking about like, you know, elementary, middle school, or let's say middle school, because I did go to Morada. I went to Morada Middle. And uh, there was no like the... New Marauder, that wasn't there. It was just all dirt. So it's kind of crazy now. You know, all the houses, they got the little baseball diamond and stuff for the kids there and stuff now. But there was no McNair High School. There was no Chavez High School. There was, you know, it's different. Stockton done changed a lot and it's, it's grown a lot. All right. So, uh, but yeah, I'm definitely not in Brookside. I actually used to live in Brookside before we moved to Arkansas. All right. All right. All right. Let's get into it, man. I want to start by some of the film. And I'm watching some All-22 this morning. And right away, I see some things that were just, I don't know, just kind of intriguing. All right. So first, we're going to talk about Patrick Peterson. OK, and this is really more so about concepts. Uh, I, I put a tweet out there that tagged Richard Sherman in there and Richard Sherman kind of gave his thoughts on what it was, which he said red for, I believe, which is kind of this quarter's coverage you run uh, near the red zone. I have always, always, always admitted I am not the I'm not the biggest uh, scheme guy. All right. There's going to be some guys on social media that's definitely more, uh, better with the scheme or, you know, they should be talking about it a lot more than me, I guess you could say, but let's get into kind of one of the things that I saw right away. I'm more of a technical guy. All right. So when you want to talk about technique, I got you on that. I got you on that for sure. Scheme, uh, you know, I'm kind of hit and miss a little bit. All right. So here we go. We got some scheme going on. Make sure everybody can see this. Yeah. Y'all see the 49ers. Uh, looking good right there. I kind of like these road uniforms. All right, anyways, what are we seeing here? All right, I'll let it run through first, the play, and you kind of see it, and boom. And so I see the play, and I'm like, well, how did Brennan Ayuk get so wide open? So I watch it again. Boom. And then I'm like, well, damn, they only had two guys in route. So this is like max protection to the max, right? You got the running back in the block. You got doubles everywhere. You got Kyle's use check here in the block. 
All right, so this is max protection with two guys in route. So essentially, when you have one, two, three, four, five guys rushing, that means you got, what, six guys <laughs> out in coverage. One, two, three, four, five, six to cover two. All right, now, if this is quarters, all right, which uh, Mike Sherman said, he said red four, all right, you got a switch release here. So this was the first thing I noticed, the switch release. Typically, if we're playing the percentages, all right, typically, when you see a switch release with the receivers, it's it's kind of rare you get an outbreaking route, all right? So a lot of times you got one guy coming here on the post, you'll get a switch release, but then he'll come post too, and he'll just come off of this guy's ass. He'll kind of come behind him, all right? And ideally what they want to do is take the safety's eyes. Now, the tough thing for, for here is, and it makes it look, I think, way worse than what it is, <laughs> there's only two guys in route. So he's seeing him and it's like, boom, his eyes right here, directly on Debo Samuel. People think he's reading the quarterback. I don't think he's reading the quarterback. I think he's looking right at Debo. And then boom. All right, now he kind of like, okay, I'm kind of squeezing this. Let me get my eyes back to the quarterback. Good job by the quarterback too. I ain't Debo Samuel. So he takes everybody to Debo, at least everybody that's eyeing the quarterback. He's doing his job, catching him coming across the field. So now you end up with one-on-one -on -one at the top. And one thing I think that Kyle Shanahan does a really good job of is identifying quarters and then having his quarters beaters in there. All right. So clearly, unless he just flat out busted this coverage, the safety here, unless he just flat out busted the coverage, uh, this is a good job of getting the safety's eyes here with this crossing here. And now I got one-on-one -on -one with a corner outside, typically in quarters, that corner is going to be outside. So any in-breaking route, there should be a window to throw into. So even if Patrick Peterson doesn't slip here, there still should be a window for him to throw that ball into. Now, obviously, Pat P slipped, so now it's an even bigger window, all right? And he's kind of standing there and catching it. Boom. Now, what can we learn from Pat P, right? Like, if you're a defensive back out there or anybody that just kind of wants to understand some of the, like, rules that we always talk about, all right, no, no matter what, at the end of the day, all coverage is kind of turning to man, all right? So even if it's zone, at some point, once two goes away, which originally he was one, right? So you got one, you got two, all right? But once a guy goes away and he dives in right now, boom. Once he's going away, essentially this is man on Brandon Knight, all right? Now, as a defensive back, what I can't do is I can't play into the end zone. Like, this is something that we all know. This is something I'm pretty sure Patrick Peterson knows, all right? But maybe he just lost track of where he was. But receivers always want to break their route off right around the one to the goal line. So ideally what I would do, and I always say ideally because, you know, hey, it's the NFL. Uh, things happen fast. You got some good players out there. But ideally what you want to do is you want to kind of plant your feet here and, you know, move them a little bit so you're active. But you kind of want to play catch, all right? And playing catch essentially is just this guy running at me. I'm going to play catch, and I'm going to dictate his route depth, all right? But what Peterson does is he ends up backing into the end zone. And where does Ayuk makes his break? Right around a one to the goal line. So th this is typically where they make their break, whether they're going to go out, where they're going to go corner, where they're going to fade, post, in, slant, whatever. It's typically right around here. And I can't let I can't let him dictate when he wants to do it. I need to be here, make him make this break earlier than he wants to, and then just flatten that route off. All right. But he didn't. And then he slipped. And then I used wide open for a touchdown. So great stuff, Brandon Ayu. And then his buddy patted him on the head, like, it's okay. Watch the pat. It's okay, Pat P. You're still the man. You are still the man, Pat P. All right. So there's that right there. Okay. Uh, TV commentary says that once the QB is out of the pocket, defenders can uh, push re receivers. You can. You definitely can do that. And um, that is, you know, obviously there's a legal contact. But if a – and that's why they'll, they'll say, while the quarterback was in the pocket – that's why you hear them say that part. While the quarterback is in the, in the pocket. All right, here we go. We got one more, one more play that I kind of wanted to look into here. All right, and this one is – Patrick Peterson, all right? I ain't picking on Pat P. Actually, this was a good play by him. And we got uh, present, share, window, and boom. All right, here we go. 
So I'm not picking on Patrick Peterson. This is actually a good play by him. Patrick Peterson caught a lot of flack from 49 fans because he said, I got a tail and I'll let you know about it when I get an interception. I don't know what his tail is, all right, or what it was that he saw that he knew he'd have an opportunity at some point to pick off a pass. But right here, he's he's squatting on this route. Boom, and he breaks, and he has an opportunity. Like, that was his opportunity for a pick. So I know he's caught a lot of slack. He just dropped it. He dropped it. And when you see the, like, like TV copy replay, you see him. But this is a good job. I mean, he's breaking on it. He's ready. He undercuts the ball, and he just right there. It just goes through his hands. So I guess what could the 49ers have done a little bit better here? All right. I think maybe, and again, it's tough because you could say, Oh man, George Kittle, George Kittle got to give him more at the top of this route here. Like, you know what I'm saying? Maybe hit him with that bomb bomb. We call it like a rocker step. All right. So if he jabs left, right, and then crosses his face. But also, a lot of these things are like timing. So maybe he didn't have time to do that. He just had to get in route. All right. What is this route by you check? Nope. You check's going out. All right. So he might just have to kind of get into his route here. So he can give him something at the top. And he just had to kind of flatten that route off, try to get there with speed. And hopefully he slips again. <laughs> Patrick Peterson slips again. Well, he didn't hear, and he almost had the interception. So uh, I know he's caught a lot of flack from 49 fans uh, because of the, the you know, oh, there's a tail, there's a tail. And, you know, here's the funny thing about tails. He definitely thought he'd get an interception off of a tail or two or whatever it was. But there could be times on film, and I'll look to see if, if I find it, where he did jump a route or he did get what he was thinking he would get, and the 49ers shied away from throwing the ball in that direction. So uh, that's something that obviously you won't really see on the TV copy, but I bet there's some plays where he's in position, he thought the 49ers would throw it a certain way, and maybe uh, Brock Purdy was just like, I'm not throwing it there. I'm not throwing it there. We got Gammon in the chat. Shout out to my dog Gammon. He says, is number 19 getting double teamed more than Brandon Ayuk? That's something I have to look into. Uh, when I was just watching the film just now, that's not what jumped out to me. It looks like the 49ers just kind of run their concepts, and it looked like the uh, the Steelers just kind of ran their defense. But I do have to look and see if there is more attention because I don't think doubles look like what a lot of people – think a lot of times it's kind of just this bracket where you do have a guy in coverage, but there's kind of like a little bit of help over the top. Are 49ers doing that with Debo or are teams doing that with Debo? I, I would say more times than not, you see that safety help more specifically with a receiver that can really take the top off of a defense. If it's a guy that kind of wins underneath, especially wins a certain way, which Debo is not really going to win with routes. So you might just take your chances with your guy in coverage as opposed to double teaming Debo. Now that's not to say that he might not draw more attention if he's running through a zone, but I think just in general, like when the play starts, I don't know if they're like, all right, like we see, I, we see Debo and we're going to bracket Debo Samuel. Now again, I'll look, but I feel like with the way the 49ers offense is, and there's so many weapons, I don't know if any one guy is getting double again, might get more attention. Uh, there might be something in, on film where they're like, hey, when Debo lines up here, uh, just know I'm going to pass this off to you or whatever. Like those conversations might happen in meetings, but just flat out doubles like you might see for Justin Jefferson, right? Or how teams cover like the Bengals with Jamar Chase, how teams cover, you know, uh, Tyreek Hill, where they're making it more obvious that they are shading a safety over the top. I don't know if the 49ers receivers are getting defended that way. At least not yet. And then once you do, that's a whole different ball game, right? Because we've seen Justin Jefferson where once it was clear, this is the guy and he's kind of going crazy and we got to stop this guy. They started putting brackets on him and then he started beating brackets too. And when you start talking about like best receivers in the league and why is guys that when once you can beat those brackets. Now, if teams are shading guys over the top or they are trying to bracket guys, what can you do as a quarterback or as a team or a coordinator Start putting that guy in motion, all right? So we saw that a lot with Devontae Adams when he was with Green Bay. Okay, you want to bracket him? I'm going to motion him to a tight split here. I'm going to get off, and then they do things from there. And it makes it a little bit harder to bracket that guy, especially in space. So um, I don't know if Debo is facing doubles. There might be certain plays where he gets more attention based off alignment, 
but I would have to really look. If I had to guess, I don't think he's facing the same type of brackets as a guy like Justin Jefferson. Uh, more eyes are on Debo because of motions and all that. I don't know if they feel the need to bracket him, though. No. Yeah, that's what. Now, again, I might look and see that Debo's getting bracketed. And, go, all right, yeah, maybe they are doubling him. But on the touchdown, you saw eyes definitely uh, go to Debo. But I don't know if it was like, man, this guy is screaming through the middle of this field and the 49ers like to attack the middle of the field. Okay, let's, let, like, let's go with that guy. And then you get B.A. behind it. And I think that brings me to kind of like my next topic, all right? And that is Kyle Shanahan. And I think he's kind of this guy that's been tagged as a, a genius offensively. And I think we could separate the two, right? Like Kyle Shanahan has kind of faced some scrutiny, I guess you could say, in the media or within the fan base or whatever, right? Like just with the way he handles kind of certain situations. And – I think as a general manager, and that's why some coaches don't want to be GM, right? Like they might want to have a little bit of roster control, but I think it's very clear to a lot of us that a lot of things that go on with the 49ers go through Kyle Shanahan, like get his final approval. Okay. And because of that, like he's going to get the uh, brunt of the, you know, people being upset more than maybe a coach where it's just like, Hey, I am not the GM. I am just, I'm just a coach here. All right. So, if we just identify Kyle Shanahan as just a coach and we remove all the other aspects of what he does um, away, I think most people would say, man, maybe he is a little bit more on the genius side. And I'm watching the film, and one thing was very clear, and we'll get to Brock Purdy in a second, him being the top 15 quarterback, maybe top 10, I don't know. But um, we'll get to Brock Purdy in a second. But it was very clear that the passing windows are there. Are like there, there were these like huge gaping windows consistently in this game for Brock Purdy to throw into. And I think Kyle Shanahan, I remember listening to him some years back and some of the things that he does very well. He understands how to uh, attack DB's rules or really just coverage guys' rules. It might not even be just cover guys, I, I think he does it in the run game as well, but he knows how to attack defenders' rules and use them against them, all right? So, for example, let's say we're in a cover three, right? And you have four verts, all right? So cover three, you got four verts. That means, you know, the you know furthest outside guy, he's running a go route. Uh, second guy, he's running a go route, all right? Now, the corner, his rule is, well, I got my entire third, all right? I got my entire third. So damn near hash to the sideline, damn near. All right, so if you got two guys running vert at you and maybe that underneath guy doesn't carry that two going vert because there's a back in the backfield or whatever it is, there's going to be a window there. And Kyle understands that. So it puts the corner in conflict. Do I squeeze two more because that's the easier throw up the seam or do I favor the outside guy more? Well, typically I would say, you know, you need to favor the, the seam a little bit more because that's the nearest throw to the quarterback. All right, like that's the ball that travels the least amount of distance. Kyle understands that. So he'll use that rule against the cornerback. Now, Kyle's not the only guy that does that. I mean, I'm pretty sure all office coordinators know how to do it. But there clearly is something that Kyle is doing that everybody else wants to utilize in their offenses and kind of steal some of his concepts. Uh, when you listen to Play Callers, the podcast, it was very clear that of all the smart guys, Kyle Shanahan was like the leader of it. And he has kind of like this relentless uh, attitude towards, towards learning it. I think the toughest thing for him is – he is the smartest guy in the room, but then he like wants everybody to know he's the smartest guy in the room. And I don't think there's any uh, indication of that more than when RG3 told the story about learning a play. And Kyle was like, hey, man, like run a play. I want you to like teach the team a play. Like you come up with the play, you teach them the play. And then based off of that, like, you know, We'll, we'll see, right? So RG3 runs this play. It was terrible the first day. They came back the next day, and then, boom, it worked. And then Kyle Shanahan told RG3, like, it felt good, huh? Like, did it feel good when that play worked? And you're going to do everything possible to make sure that play works. And he's like, yeah. Kyle said, well, that's how I feel about all my plays. So basically, as much effort as you put into doing your own play, put that same effort into my plays because all my plays work, right? And I was just like, damn. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. 
But when you compare that to like Andy Reid, right? And maybe we should stop saying Andy Reid. But I think we get insight. Like when they're good coaches, you get insight on what they do. And uh, with Kyle, we are comparing him to like the upper echelon of coaches. We're not comparing him to uh, guys that you don't expect to be, you know, certain type of coaches or leaders, et cetera. All right. So like he's clearly he's at the top in how we view him. But I was listening to Patrick Mahomes on the show quarterbacks. And if you haven't watched quarterbacks, I suggest you listen to it. Pretty good stuff. Patrick Mahomes talked about how every week Andy Reid lets them come up with a play. And it's like, all right, like you guys get that one play, you get to, you know, run it, you get to practice it, you get to come up with it. And just incorporating like your players, you talk about buying in, like you get the ultimate buy-in with that, right? And it just gives them this certain level of like freeness. And we, I think we see that with Pat, uh, Patrick Mahomes, how he plays kind of has like this freeness to him. I think a part of that is with how his coach like coaches him to where, you know, yeah, you might make a mistake. It's cool. Like, you know, we'll, we'll live with it. We'll move on. And then you just go and continue to make plays. I think with Kyle, the way he's kind of handled his quarterbacks, is like really tight and, and, and rigid. And it's like a, like, do it my way. Right. Which essentially is what he told RG three years ago, like do it my way. And I think that's, it's a little tougher because it's all, like, you're always trying to please them. And I think it was uh, Jake Plummer who talked about how it was hard to play for, Mike Shanahan, because he just never felt like anything he did was good enough. So um, I'm not saying that's the case with Kyle and Brock, but I think, you know, as it pertains to Kyle being kind of a genius, I think he does a lot of things very well. And when you watch his schemes, and again, I'm not this offensive guy or offensive guru, but it's clear when I'm watching what he's doing to manipulate coverage and get these big windows. I think he does a terrific job with that. And I remember years ago, and I need to find a soundbite so I can play that soundbite, but I remember years ago, Steve Young was talking about how he would love to play for Kyle Shanahan's offense. And uh, he would ask Kyle, like, you know, do you audible, right? Like, do you have the quarterbacks audible? And he's like, no. And Steven is like, why don't you audible into a different play? And he's like, well, my plays have all the answers. And I don't think anything was more evident than that, like evident with that than when I just watched the film. And now we're going to kind of get into Brock Purdy. But I just saw in this group chat on – on on uh, Twitter where they're like, anybody can play in Kyle's offense. And I would say that you don't have to be the most special, purest passer to play in this offense. There are offenses where you probably do have to be a little bit more special. And maybe you don't with Kyle. But it's very clear. You just have to understand what it is he's trying to do and understand that the answers are all there. All right? So, hey, when, when I when – I, you know, when we go over it and this, hey, there's going to be this huge window. I want you to hit this window, right? If you see the defense the way that I do, and he's probably talking to him, you know, before the mic gets cut off, you know, at 15 seconds. But when you when you watch it, it's like the answers are all there, all right? And one thing about Brock Purdy, and this is the part where I think it kind of, you would ideally like a guy that has all these special attributes to still be able to get to all the answers of the offense. That would be ideal. I think that's what would really take this offense over the top. But I think if you have what Brock Purdy has, which is his ability to really process quick. And I know people throw that out there, but when I saw how quick, again, now I'm comparing him to Trey Lance. But I remember in the uh, preseason, there was uh, Trey Lance looked right. Right, he looked. He looked to his right, and the and the DB jumped it. He jumped the hitch, so he comes off of that, comes back in the middle, and doesn't. And he has a guy right there. He doesn't get the ball out of his hands, right, and he gets sacked. And it's like I understand it was a quick. It's supposed to be a quick uh, throw. All right, got to outside. Dang, he jumped that. I can't throw that. Let me come back, and then dang, I get sacked. And we can say, oh man, the offensive line, like it's so bad. But I watched Brock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where he was about to throw that out uh, a quick throw outside the numbers or around the numbers to Brandon Ayuk, wherever it was, and they jumped it. So he quickly came off of that, knew where his guy was right here, boom, threw it to him. We talk about having the answers, all right? And that's the answer. I come here quick, they jumped that, let me snap right back here, get the ball out of my hands, and it almost like he did it blind down there, okay? But I don't know if everybody can do that. I think everybody can make that throw, but does everybody get to that throw as fast as he did when they took away one. And I'm talking about he did it fast. It was like, boom, oh, no, boom, ball's out. 
completion, five yards, cool. Put us in a better position. And as it pertains to, to Brock, I think he does that consistently, right? So when there are the gaping windows there, which they are on there, I mean, huge windows, and he throws the timing and rhythm, it looks really good, and he's hitting those guys, and that's awesome. When it's maybe not as gaping, he still does a good job of playing with timing and still can complete the pass. And then when they take those things away, he gets to the answer, which, again, that's what Steve Young said. The, 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 the answers, they're there on every play. And when we look at how well uh, Brock Purdy is, is playing, it's because he understands where the answers are. So I don't think it takes a special uh, physical freak to do that, but it definitely takes a special mind to do that. Because if it were that simple, then everybody would do it. And I don't think everybody can do it. So that's one thing that I've really grown to appreciate with Brock Purdy's game. Um, I saw this special throw from Matthew Stafford yesterday. He made a couple just like special throws. That's not going to be Brock's game. All right. Shoot, there's some special throws from from Lance where he kind of when it looked like one was like a, a bender, like it like the ball bend around the guy and then went to like a perfect. That's not going to be Brock's game. But if you want somebody that's going to consistently just, the guy's open, I'm going to get him the ball. This guy, they took this away. I'm going to get to this next answer really quick. Brock does that consistently. And I really truly think that that's all Kyle Shanahan needs. Now, we're going to listen to Michael Parsons and what he had to say about one Brock Purdy. And I just don't think that we should sleep on Brock Purdy no more. Yes, he was a seventh-round pick. Yes, he came in late in the season and won six straight games, took him to the NFC Championship before his injury. But Purdy, you would not be slept on no more, brother. I think people are coming for you the same way they come for Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes. Yes, you are surrounded by a great team, but you are playing your butt off, and uh, you got one hell of a story, brother. Um, if we were to rank Purdy right now, I would put Purdy around. I think Purdy's a top 15 quarterback. There's things that we still want to see from Purdy, not when Purdy's winning, but when Purdy's down. You know, I think the adversity aspect of the football game is huge. Learning how to play from behind, learning situational football. Um, it's not something I'm saying he can't do. It's just something that we just haven't seen yet. All right. So that, that was good stuff by – uh, Michael Parsons, and just to kind of break it down, it's like, man, like, you, what do you say? Like, he's he's checking all the boxes, he's he's answering all the questions. I think he's doing a terrific job. You know, I had questions that I wanted to answer, right? And you know, it's funny. I get on Twitter, and there are people like, "Crap, you weren't all in on Brock. You had questions." Okay, well, can the motherfucker answer the questions? And then I'm good. Like, I ain't saying this dude can't do it or that he can't be that. And now, maybe I think sometimes with either fans or fan bases and i think i saw this on i saw like a cowboys guy or something like that and he was like shoot they told me brock something whatever they, they 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 didn't like brock or they was racist or they said some kind of wild stuff and i'm like don't lump everybody there are like i think this is the tough thing with like negative comments negative comments are very loud so people hear that more than the 90 percent of positive comments so on a consistent basis i think people were fairly either high to very optimistic on brock purdy as was i but maybe i wasn't at like at like level 10 as like some other people like um you know terra dome in our chat or uh there's there's some other people in the chat but like where it's just like oh king purdy he's the best ever and it's like oh no like let me you know let, let, let's see right uh, but I think week one is like, man, he answered a lot of questions for me after last year, seeing what he did. Like, can he continue to do that? And I thought he did. So it was like, hey, this might just be him. Now, he said that he believes he's a top 15 quarterback. So let's start to kind of dive into some of the quarterbacks that potentially are ahead of him. Because I think it's easy to say that somebody is top 15, top 10, uh, you know, at quarterback or receiver or whatever, without like talking about the guys that potentially are ahead of him. Okay. So I started looking at guys that were potentially ahead. Right? I'm just naming off quarterbacks. And it starts to get a little weird once you get around 8, 9, 10. And when I say weird, it's tough because you start to get in this area of guys that might be, again, more like 
special might pass the eye test. But are they playing better football than Brock Purdy? So a name out there, uh, Dak Prescott. He's right around like that 10, QB 10 range. And if you would have asked me in the offseason or even prior, like, would you take Dak Prescott over Brock, you know, all things considered equal, I'd probably be like, yeah. But the more Brock keeps checking off these boxes, is like, I understand that these guys might be bigger and it might look a little flashier, but I think Brock, if Kyle wanted to, he could throw for 400 yards in the game. Like, he, in a lot of these games, he's kind of called the dogs off. And it's like, they're just blowing teams out. And that kind of plays into what uh, Parsons was talking about with like facing adversity. We, we haven't truly seen a whole lot of adversity that he's had to face. Like, have we watched a game where he's been behind like 10, like 10 points? It's like, damn, you're behind. Like your defense isn't playing well. You're behind 10 points. Uh, what do you do in that situation? Like, what does it look like? Do you, are you still calm? Like, are you still making the right decisions under pressure? So far, it's like, it's been probably the most advantageous situation for a quarterback. So uh, that's not saying he can't do it. That's just he hasn't really been in that type of position. Okay. So that is part of it. Now, I'm looking at some of these other guys. Tua. I, I would say Tua is cooking right now. And Tua is, is looking a lot like if, again, you got to take into account what these guys are asked to do. So maybe Tua is just asked to carry – the Dolphins more before a guy everybody was killing a year ago, right? Prior to last season, they wanted Tua out. He's a bust. He's not this. Shouldn't have been the top five pick. Wow. Can't believe you took Justin Herbert or you took uh, Tua over Herbert. And right now, if you ask the Miami Dolphins, who would you rather have, Tua or Herbert? I think they're like, we like our guy Tua, right? So you look at him, uh, there's Deshaun Watson in that range. And Watson, I think, based off of this special we've seen from Watson, you'd be like, yeah, I'd take him over Brock. But I'd say if you go off of what he's played, and again, now, it, this is tough with, with him because he did the weird shit off the field and he missed a lot of time. And he came back, he didn't play great. And then he, and then he played in preseason, didn't look great. Then he played the other day and it just did not look, it looked look stinky. All right. Well, everything I've seen from Brock has been positive. So... Would I take Brock right now over Deshaun Watson? I mean, shoot, if you asked me this a year ago, I'd be like, there's no effing way. Well, a year prior to the, you know, the weird stuff. But um, if you asked me then, I'd be like, there's no way, like Deshaun Watson. But if you ask me now, Brock Purdy or Watson, I'm going to say, I love what I've seen from Brock Purdy. I'm sorry. Like, I just love it. So uh, he's shown me a lot of really good things. Uh, you have other quarterbacks there, Matthew Stafford. I kind of threw Geno Smith on there, but, I, you know, I take Brock over him right now. Uh, it starts to get a little slim. So I don't know. Y'all can make a list on how many quarterbacks would you really take over Brock? And there's Mahomes. There's Burrow. After watching Josh Allen, <laughs> and it's crazy. I was just about to say Josh Allen, and I look in the chat, and I see uh, E. Nice, and he says Josh Allen looks super bad. He, he did. He did. Josh Allen looked terrible. All right, but Josh Allen. Now, now here's the thing. What they asked Josh Allen – I don't want to make excuses for Josh Allen. Like, he made some terrible decisions. Like, those throws, like, into the end, uh, he made some terrible throws, terrible decisions. And I don't think that had anything to do with, oh, man, everything is on Josh. He has to carry this team. He does. So I don't know if that's the reason why he puts the ball in harm's way more. But, or if it's a Jets thing. I'm, I was watching the game last year. He threw two terrible interceptions playing against the Jets. And it's like, and then they lost. It's like, maybe he just, there's just something about the Jets and Robert Sala and what he's doing. Robert Sala is killing them. Okay, but um, I think there's an argument that Brock Purdy is not only a top 15 quarterback, but he's a top 10. And if you agree or disagree, I would love to see, like, who are your top 10 quarterbacks? And with the way that Brock Purdy has played, who, who are you taking over him based off of what we know? All right, so I, I think he potentially is – a top 10 quarterback. Now, he might be nine, he might be 10, but it's hard because I can't compare the rosters and the coach, you know, and, and that's the toughest part. You know, do I, can I, you know, if I were to put Trevor Lawrence in this offense with this cast and this coach, would it look different than what it consistently looks like with the Jags? 
you know, though, you know, I know he's able to do some special things throwing the football. Um, he's athletic, uh, mobile quarterback. Would it just look different if he got to sit in this offense and play in this offense? If it's not going to look different, would you take right now, you know, Brock Purdy over Trevor Lawrence just based off of how they have played? I don't know. That's a tough one. All right, now, last thing I want to talk about, and I'll put the link in the chat for everybody. Um, again, make sure you guys like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, we also are, you know, powered by Underdog Fantasy. I've been playing a lot of Underdog Fantasy. I missed last night off of uh, – what I missed last night off of? Oh, I needed, I needed one more touchdown from Josh Allen, and he just went cold. He threw a touchdown. I'm like, oh, got this in the bag. I'm finna – Money, 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 money. I'm finna get this money and all that. And Josh Allen just never threw another touchdown. Never even had a chance. Matter of fact, all the times that he did potentially have a chance, he was throwing interceptions. All right, so, damn. He cost me some money last night. Missed out. But y'all can get in on this, man. Underdog Fantasy. Download the app or go to underdogfantasy.com and use promo code CROCKY. That's C-R-O-C-K-Y. And they'll double your initial deposit up to $100. All right. Uh, if you missed out on the season long plays for underdog fantasy, you missed out, man. I, I got some good stuff and I'm going to see how it all plays out right now. You know, taking Brandon Ayuk's the higher on his yards for the season. <laughs> easy money. Even Debo Samuels, that should be easy money. I took Christian McCaffrey's rushing. Easy money. There's a lot of easy money. I did not take anything with Aaron Rodgers in it. And I'm glad I didn't. And that's unfortunate. He got hurt. Matter of fact, I'm sick. I'm sick for the Jets. I tell people all the time, like, before anything else, like, I am a football fan. Like, I love football. If the 49ers went away tomorrow, I wouldn't care because I could still watch football. Like, I just love football. And I love watching good football. And it sucks when, you know, the league, it felt like, especially the AFC was in, like, a really good place with the quarterbacks. And you see everything that the Jets did and being a, like building around Aaron Rodgers and just the hype and and the you know you watch how everybody just gravitated to him with with the Jets on hard knocks and it was like it was good stuff and then it's like boom the first drive of the game or, or you know he's out he's done for the year torn Achilles ruptured Achilles and I'm just like golly like that sucks because I want to watch good football. And the tough thing is the Jets are on primetime television for like five more games. So we got to watch Zach Wilson. I won't judge Zach Wilson too much because when I say he won't judge him, it's like, first of all, I think he's been stinky. But when I say I won't judge him, I, I won't judge uh, like last night's performance. You weren't the guy. You probably just doing scout team stuff, whatever. But I will be judging. And again, I remember watching, I was watching one bro and I'm like, hey, it's clearly no Brock Purdy. All right. <laughs> Being able to just come in and be lights out. But you, you, now you got to play, play Dallas. And I think Dallas is just going to drum them. All right. But you got to prepare. You got to play them. And uh, we'll see. Like, the, the Jets have a great defense. But, man, it's just I, I wanted to see Aaron Rodgers. I wanted to see the Jets with Aaron Rodgers against the Dallas Cowboys. I wanted to see the Jets with Aaron Rodgers against, you know, uh, Patrick Mahomes and, and whoever else they play. And we got robbed of that. So that's tough. All right. Here we go. Uh, I'll put the clock on. My callers, hold on, got the handy dandy uh, buzzer coming on. And I don't know, what, what buzzer do y'all want me to use for the timer? All right, everybody's going to get, uh, we got three, three and a half minutes. All right, and where's my sounds at? Are we going to go with this? No, not that one. Maybe I can cut it short. Maybe I can just play like a drum beat, like, all right, wrap it up. That's kind of a long. That's kind of long. All right, maybe we'll just go. All right, so that's like, thank you. Like, that's the, with the clapping. That's like, all right, thank you all. Thank you for coming on. All right, but I do have two people here ready to talk and um, two great callers. All right, so first up, we got Tia Ingram. It's Tia Ingram. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. How, how are you feeling about the game? Uh, I, was, I wasn't surprised because, I, I mean, in my opinion, I think – Teams that you're superior of, I think you should automatically beat them. Now, regardless of what the score is, I still believe you should beat them. Just kind of like last year, I think we shouldn't have lost the Chicago game, but the defense didn't show up, you know, and then like the Broncos. It was just, you know, 
a defensive game. So I think the teams that you're supposed to beat, I think we should beat. I'm not really surprised. The true test is where we have to play the the good teams, you know, with legit defenses. That's when I will be able to say, oh, okay, we look like we can do this. But I'm not going to be overly excited because we beat the Steelers because I didn't think the Steelers was just good in my opinion. You know, I know people try to hype it up, but in my opinion, I don't – I haven't heard anything that would have shocked me. It was like, oh, okay. The Steelers really got a good team. I, I really don't hear people say that. So I don't, I didn't understand why we were hyping it up, I guess, about the Steelers. But, I mean, it was a good win. A win is a win. I, I mean, a win is a win. That was a terrific win. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not – I mean, it was a good win, but I'm not overly excited because we beat the Steelers. You know, the way yeah. the Rams look, we need to be worried about the Rams. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> yes, because no matter what happens, Sean McVay will have his team ready. You know, so I just think that we need to just be prepared because we they got a lot of rookies, but they play good. You know, Seattle ain't no joke. So they got some legit wide receivers over there. And for them to beat Seattle like that, yeah, we might want to be ready to play, you know, on offense. I'm not talking about defense. I know a defense is going to show up, but on offense, I think we need to be ready because I think Matthew Stafford is going to push the ball down the field. And I know Kyle usually kind of get kind of tight sometimes when he plays Sean McVay sometimes in the second half. So hopefully he'll be a little bit more, you know, like the New Orleans game right. where you knew, okay, Drew Brees out here, we got to go toe for toe kind of thing. So I don't know. Gotcha. And do, do you have any, like, takeaways from anything you saw, like, offensively? Or is, are there things that you're, like, looking more forward to kind of seeing? Um, the, it was, well, it was two things on offense that I was a little worried about. I, I, I saw yesterday when you were saying, you know, McKit you really wasn't worried about it with McKit is because it was T.J. Watt. But my <laughs> thing, I don't care if it's T.J. Watt or somebody they pick up off the street. You need to do your job. Yeah. And one of those sacks was on Brock Purdy because he held the ball too long, kind of like in the Eagles game. He held on to it too long. You got, if you don't see it, throw it away. You know, you see Tom Brady, I'm not getting hit. I'm going to throw this ball out of bounds, and we fit to go to shut it down. So I think with that, I'm a little worried about because we, we do got some, like, legit defenses coming up, you know. I mean, even though the Giants got beat up like that, but that was offense. They defense, they still got a good defense because Dallas really didn't put any points light that up it was really the defensive side of the Cowboys that really scored most of the points yeah. we got the Browns we got the Ravens we got the Bengals you know we do have Seattle we do have the Rams you know there's a lot of teams that got legit pass rushers and I don't I don't think we need to I think we need to be you know he needs to Kyle needs to be more aware of who we going up against on that side so that and then I, I didn't like Brock. He kind of looked kind of skittish a little sometimes, a little bit in the second half. The first half, they were rolling. You know, they was doing what they were supposed to do. But in the second half, it's kind of like the pass rush kind of got to him a little bit, which was kind of weird to see. So I don't know if he was just – they were just feeling themselves. I don't know. But it was a couple times where he was getting hit on their arm. And when we play a little bit more better defense, I'm a little worried about him holding on to the ball and not letting it go when he should or just live to see another down. I feel so. Gotcha. All right. Good stuff, Tia. Appreciate you for coming on. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Next caller coming on. We got my guy, Gammon. Yes, sir. All right, Gammon, the floor is yours. Okay. I, and I want to put a vote for the, uh, for the horn because some people, you know, they don't, they don't land the plane. Uh, they don't breathe when they talk. So sometimes it, they kind of need the, uh, they need that horn to kind of go over them. But hold on, real quick, and I know you're on now, so it kind of defeats the purpose. But you did send the super chat. Let me make sure I paused. Yeah, I paused it. All right. Uh, you said to be fair, you were one of the first major people who covered the 49ers to say Brock was QB one. Uh, what game last season did you know? And why do you hate? <laughs> why no, do you no. hate? Yeah. But you know what? You know, here's a crazy thing. So I just got hate. There was just somebody. Uh, I should delete my tweet because I kind of like got at him pretty tough, but. Someone just commented, said, now you like Brock Purdy. Ha, ha, ha. This clown was a transsexual to the max before. Like, he's commenting because, you know, I'm live on Twitter right now, too. Right. I was like, bitch, shut up. But, like, my, my thing is, like, 
when did I ever like not like Brock? When when did I when did I ever say like man this dude's bad like this dude can't play like no nah, get this dude out of here? I, I don't I don't know I don't I don't recall that I I just know that you and um, Brian Peacock have received like quite a bit of heat over the quarterback stuff but I you seem to be on Brock's like there was nothing to hate about his game or what you saw um, and and like I remember you were kind of like the first one to say like hey I think next season be before this season was last season was even over you're like Brock's QB number one and you kind of publicly said that out loud before anybody else did and a lot of people then I think felt more comfortable um, co-signing to that and it was like when Peacock said hey uh, Sam Darnold's probably gonna be quarterback number two everyone jumped down his throat and about 24 36 hours later um, it, it ended up being the case but yeah I was just curious for you why you think you receive uh, you guys receive so much hate whereas like I mean your analysis is either, either spot on or, or you guys go into pretty good detail as to why that is um, I, I think it's because fans and again you gotta remember the root word fan is fanatical I think there are a lot of people that want you to be like super high this way or super high that way right like they don't want uh and, and it also too there are some people that are very emotional with even their coverage of the 49ers and I think because Peacock and I remove our remote our emotions from how we feel Right. And there was a time where I was too like, man, like you should want Trey to be the guy because like, man, it just makes your team have a higher ceiling. And that's nothing against Brock. It just that's what it felt like. Right. And right now I say, man, I think this team could go really far with, with Brock. But I think there are just people that they just they want it this way or that way. And anything in between, they take out a lot of the context and they just hear the part that they want to hear. So I might say, man, Brock Purdy, man, he processes very well. You know, I think he makes the right reads. You know, it seems like he finds the answers, man. You know, the, the one thing that might be tough for him, he just doesn't have a big arm. So maybe there's some throws where he might need a big arm to make that throw and he just can't make it. And they'll just take that where it's like, Croc didn't like Brock because he said he didn't have a big arm. And he's like, hey, you hear anything else I just said? So I think that's where, um, you know, obviously it depends on, the person listening, I think a lot of people that listen to me every day, uh, they, you know, y'all, y'all understand. I mean, we sit up here, we talk all the time, but there are a number of people that watch uh, or might see one thing or something. Like there was somebody that was like, Croc, you've been hating on Brock. I'm like, when I hate on Brock. And there was a tweet from when Brock first got in the game against the, the Dolphins. And I saw some balls kind of like float a little bit. And but passes still float, right? And I was like, man, my arm is stronger than Brock's, but we're going to get through this together. Like, that's what I said, right? And I still feel to this day that my arm is stronger than Brock's. Like, <laughs> like, but I can throw a ball 65 yards in the air. So it's not like I have a weenie arm. Like, I'm not just like a random person. So when I say that, it's like, no, that, we got videos of me throwing the football where I'm rolling to the left and I throw all the way back this way, like bombs on the money, right? Like, I can throw a football. So when I say it, I don't think it's like, this super knock is just, he just doesn't have a big arm. And the biggest thing was seeing how is he going to overcome that? Like our team's going to make him uncomfortable and do things that he's uncomfortable doing. Like how is he going to combat, like maybe not having a NFL arm? Cause like, first of all, he's a quarterback, like he has a good arm, but like NFL arm, like to make certain throws. And so far it looks like he's really good at answering all the questions to the offense that Kyle Shanann has. And if you do that, Maybe you just don't need a big arm. Maybe you don't need this, like, powerful arm. Maybe you don't have to be a power thrower. I've talked about him in his elbow surgery, and people are talking about if he loses some power, what's it going to look like? And I remember saying, like, well, his, his, it might make a difference. I don't know. We'll see. But his game isn't predicated off of being a power thrower. You know? Right. So uh, there were things that I would question in the sense of how it was going to continue to play out. But in the sense of like him just being somebody that can ball, like nah. So for somebody in the, in the little comments on Twitter right now to be like, now you like him, huh? You're a Trace. Like it's like I've always liked Brock. I never not liked Brock. I called I called him um, uh, Mini Mahomes like during last season. <laughs> like yeah. you know what I'm saying? So I don't know. It's it's really weird. But but anyways, uh, I, I, the floor is yours now. The floor okay. is yours. So one of the one of the things I, I wanted also to say was beginning before the season started, I said, you know, um, it's not Brock's fault 
if he uses the weapons that he has uh, correctly. And I knew if Trey would have started for the team, people would have been saying, well, it's not Trey. It's, you know, the system and the weapons around him and everything like that. Then we should also, too, take away um, some of the greatness from a guy like Joe Montana, who had Roger Craig doing the first thousand yard rushing, first thousand yard receiving. He had Jerry Rice to throw to and really just the most innovative uh, system that's out there. Um, but uh, I did want to say this. I, I am pretty excited about going up against the Rams. I think they're a little overhyped. I was watching Locked on Rams, Locked on Seahawks. And from the Seahawks perspective of that game, it sounds like they lost both of their tackles. There are two young tackles in, in the second half of the game. And the game just really got away from them. And that's when you really kind of saw the, the Rams kind of defense just in their in their backyard. Also, too, if you look at it, um, Safford had all, to, all day to throw. He was hit maybe twice. I mean, he was he was clean as a whistle, is what the guy was saying in, in, in the Rams, uh, locked on Rams. Like, he had all this time. And so they're pretty excited about playing us. But, I mean, they're going to have significantly far more pressure than um, uh, up front than, than what they had the other week. Also, too, sound like from the Seahawks' perspective was that, you know, Carroll was kind of doing the same kind of, I don't want to say prevent defense, but where they give a lot of, like, cushion um uh off to like one side um and so the, he was just really able to complete a lot of passes uh there so um i i'm i'm pretty excited about it i, I do i think this is going to be great cardio for the 49ers um I, I do expect us to 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 blow them out just because of all that said uh but Stafford does look good he looks amazing but when you have a clean pocket uh you're really really good i, I do have a question for you though I, I'm worried about the right side of the line. And whenever I say the right side of the line, I think people misinterpret that and they just go like, oh, he's just talking about McKibbitts. When I'm looking at it right now, right? Like I'm looking at Burford and he, I think we were blessed that we didn't have Cam Hayward on the other side of that line because Bur Burford was getting killed um, more so than McKibbitts. And I'm just going like, you know, we've always somehow had like Brunskill, who was the, the quote unquote Aaron Donald stopper, um, so I, I just really kind of do, do you when, when you were kind of watching there and you because you got to go to the practices and everything like that. Were you, were you seeing that? Did it look what you saw from the right side of this offensive line? Did that look the same way in practice as it did in the Steelers game? It, is that because I just don't think Brock Purdy, he's not the biggest guy was, you know, one of my big knocks on him. And so but I just don't want him to get knocked out because I feel like once he gets knocked out, Darnold comes in, I just feel like this fan base is going to be in calamity. But All right. And I'm going to um, get you off, too, uh, now. But I, I'll answer that question off the air or okay. when you're off. But uh, as it, first, as it pertains to Brock Purdy's size, pause. I don't know if being 6'1", 215 pounds, as opposed to being you know, 6'3", 230 pounds, like if you're more, less likely to get hurt. So – uh, with him getting hit now, if he was like 190, you know, 195, or a guy like you know Bryce Young, you look at Bryce Young and he's very like thin built. Maybe I'd be a little bit more worried about it. But the way that Brock is built, he's pretty stout, so I don't worry about him being injured from that standpoint. Obviously, you know him going to throw the ball and a guy like hitting his elbow, uh, I worry about that more so than just him taking a hit and not being able to get up. Uh, we've seen a lot of quarterbacks, and I think this kind of gets underrated, but a lot of injuries from quarterbacks happen like inside the pocket. All right. So those things can sometimes be flukes. Uh, we saw what happened with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, that was unfortunate. And obviously he was trying to kind of get away from a sack, but I don't think that happened because, Oh, well, Aaron Rodgers is six two two thirty. Like, you know, that's why he ruptured his Achilles. I think he just, he just got hurt. So now as far as the right side of 49 is the offensive line, <sighs> Burford has been a guy who had to rotate last year with Daniel Brunskill. And I feel like that kind of flew under the radar a little bit, even heading into this offseason, where it was just like, well, Brunskill's the guy. No, you're good there. The only question is McKivitz, where I think Burford's kind of been a big question mark the entire time. Uh, you know, part of it is this is a guy that, what, you know, I think he played guard early on at UTSA, then ended up playing tackle, then he goes back to playing guard for the Niners. It's supposed to be kind of a it's easy, quote-unquote, nothing's easy in the NFL, but a transition to be able to play guard. And for whatever reason – and again, I didn't watch, so I'm going off of your words. If you're saying, like, it looked shaky, uh, that would be something that 
um, I would be concerned about. I haven't watched him then, and I didn't watch him in training camp. I was more so focused on, like, man, you know, what what's the difference between the quarterbacks? What do they look like? And, uh, I'll, yeah, so I was focused on that and, like, giving that analysis as opposed to, you know, what is Spencer Burford doing? Especially with a lot of the views that I was having, you know, I wasn't right there on the sideline, so it was even tougher for me. And and I would have had to spend an entire practice really just focusing on him and really not just one practice. Like, because you can have one bad practice, but like three practices. So uh, I, I don't think I'm overly concerned with Burford or even McKivitt. But again, this is something that I would like to see, see you know, kind of continue to how it's going to play out. So uh, I'll definitely keep an eye on that. All right, here we go. Last caller, last caller. We got my guy CJ. CJ. All right, let me zoom in. You got you got something. What, what's that right there that you held up? Okay. Ooh, is that like a, a chain? Like you got that on like a necklace? Yeah, I got it on a necklace. That's one of them like rapper uh, <laughs> chains that they be wearing. No, it's um Jerry Rice wore it last year to a game. Yeah. And, and he had like um like the bow tie on, and then he had one of these helmet chains, and it was blinged out, and so that's what inspired this right here but it's pretty cool i wore it to the game on sunday and a bunch of people liked it and stuff like that call it my good luck chain yeah okay well, keep wearing that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great sunday to be there and actually attend a game that goes that way because i attended three games last year the monsoon game in chicago where yeah. my wife came with me and and we get rained on as the game is over, and she just cussing me out for half a mile straight. That that was the Chicago experience. Went to the Carolina game, and we won that game. But Emmanuel Mosley got hurt, and he was out for the season. And and then I went to Philadelphia, and and then of course we all know what happened in Philadelphia. So right, it was just good to pay for a ticket, go to a game, and it it goes like I wanted to go, and so that was that was great. Um, I, I wanted to discuss our defense, man. That defense, man. They, they, they were on one. Um, Drake Jackson getting his three sacks. Bosa creating pressures. Armstead creating pressures. He didn't get a sack, but he was causing a lot of that havoc that uh, that still was stuffing the runs and allowing the linebackers to fit run gaps. Just like Fred Warner came downhill and put. And, and man, hit him harder than Doctor Strange was hit, man. And so <laughs> <laughs> Najee was floating over his body like. <laughs> Fred was flying around, that's for sure. Yeah, Fred was flying around. And so that's that's what I was real impressed with. Huff got an interception. I mean, and that really was um, by Fred Warner um, being all over, being having that sticky coverage and knocking the ball in the air for Huff to get it. And so it was just – it was a great game. Um, Brock Purdy, it was good to see that he looks like he's picked up from where he left off last season. Um, kind of held the ball a little bit in the second half. I don't know if that was a design – designs by Kyle. He was dialing up longer developing plays or people won't get open as much or I have to break that down a little bit more on, on the film to see what happened there. But all in all, it was a great game, and hopefully Brock can – make decisions to throw the football out of bounds and or make decisions quicker to do something else with it. So he doesn't take as many hits as he took. And that's probably the only negative I got from the game, really. And then, well, outside of the the Burford and McKivis thing, McKivis was going against Watt. So I don't know if he could grade that. <clears throat> but yeah. Burford, but we definitely have a Burford problem. And that, I guess that would be my, my last negative would be Burford. All right, man. CJ, man, appreciate you coming on. All right, Croc. All right. Spencer Burford. I mean, like that, that is the guy that and we'll see. We've been worried about McKivitz, and McKivitz kind of gets a mulligan because it was like, hey, man, TJ Watt. All right. But with Burford, and again, I didn't watch him closely, so I only want to talk out of my ass and say he was, he was poor or whatever. And sometimes I think we, especially watching the TV copy, we see a play – where maybe a guy gets beat and then that kind of sticks out in our mind. I would like to kind of sit and watch. Maybe I'll do that and kind of be more prepared for tomorrow to just have my thoughts on Burford and what it looked like. And maybe I can ask one of my offensive line buddies to kind of look at it and see what he thinks or at least certain clips. But overall, I thought the 49ers offensive line, 
I think Brock Purdy complements it very well in the sense of just being able to get the ball out quick. Uh, I think there were a couple of throws where if Purdy is, you know, waits a tick longer, he might get hit or, or sacked. So um, having a quarterback that sees the field well and as quickly as Brock does with his processing, I think that really helped offset maybe some of the hiccups from the offensive line. So that's something to definitely keep looking at. But um, McKivitz, I'm going to give him a mulligan, and uh, hopefully he, you know, doesn't get beat for three sacks against the damn uh, the damn Rams. All right, man. Shoot, man. I think that's going to be it for today. Appreciate everybody that tuned in on Twitter. Come over to YouTube. Type in Eric Crocker. We're going to be here live tomorrow at 8 a.m. and not 9 a.m. like we were this morning. My wife needed the, the desk. All right. Uh, make sure before you get out of here, you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit that like and subscribe. Underdog Fantasy, promo code Crocky. Download the app or go to underdogfantasy.com. The W initial deposit up to $100. But that's going to do it for this episode. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.